Um, it has been a crazy uh, month, actually, uh, for us as a ministry. And uh, today I'm going to be just sharing a bit about um, some of what's happened, but giving some context and some, I guess, teaching around it uh, to help us to really maximize the revelation that the Lord is releasing right now uh, to the body of Christ. But let me just pray before we go into the word. Father, thank you so much for what you're doing here. Um, A prayer storm, we thank you for how you're stirring and awakening intercessors across the nations and across the nation, even through the sound coming from this place. Uh, Lord, as we go into your word today, we ask that you would fill us with revelation knowledge. You fill us with your wisdom. Open the eyes of our understanding, Father. Uh, Let your fire be released of our hearts. Let there be a fresh awakening, but also strategy to be able to keep the fire burning and not burn out. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that uh, you are moving in this place. And as I speak, ask that you give me your words for this moment, for the people listening online, those watching in this room. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So I want to start by just uh, acknowledging the craziness of what's happened in the last few weeks. Um, how many of you, as was said earlier, how many of you have seen the video that was put out with James Kawaya? So for many of you, it will be the first time you're hearing that testimony, but I heard that testimony back in 2017 when I first came across uh, James Kawaya. So that's been on my kind of radar for a while. And uh, the whole idea of covenant praying has been on my mind uh, for some time. In fact, when I first heard that testimony, I said to the Lord, Lord, you know, if there's one thing I want to do, I want to do covenant praying. And I can see that stirring in many people. However, I think um, it's good that we put some knowledge and theology around zeal because zeal without knowledge can be destructive. (laughs) Did you hear me? (laughs) Because I've seen people say, I want to do covenant prayer. I'm like, I'm not sure you understand what this is. I don't, I don't think you grasp the depth and the level of commitment and what this is in, what, what is involved in committing to something like this. And so I want to take this space to do a bit of teaching around it and just bring some understanding in a way that you can appreciate what this, and I feel I have a responsibility to do that. Because, you know, when we recorded that interview, um, neither myself or James Kawaya had any idea it would go as wide as it did. You know, uh, there's sometimes we post things and I'm like, oh, I think this, I think lots of people are going to watch this and no one watches it. <laughs> so this one, honestly, I had no expectation, zero. I just thought, we'll put it out and I hope some people watch it. Literally, that's it. So to go to week one and have a million views, I think right now it's over three million views right now. It, it's just mind blowing. And pastors and leaders messaging me literally from all over the world saying, this, we've made this recommended watching for all our teams. You know, James Kawhi, I'm on the phone to him, he's saying, what's just happened? He's in shock as well. <laughs> it's like, what has just happened? You know, and it's just like, we are all completely blown away. But as I reflect on the last few months, it's not an accident that this happened because I can see how the Lord even prepared us in some of our prayers as a team to this point. It's a flashpoint even for this movement, for this ministry, because the Lord is wanting to raise up more intercessors across the earth. And we're not the only ones doing this and calling people to prayer, but He has chosen to use our sound, to be one of the sounds He's using in the earth to awaken intercessors. So when this video starts to go viral and all these crazy things start to happen, you know, we start to get reports and emails and messages from literally all sorts of people everywhere, you know, just saying how this has changed their lives. And also people posting on there saying, does anyone want to do covenant and praying with me? Does it? And people saying, oh, I want to do covenant and prayer. Even my pastors, because my wife and I are part of a local church here in Manchester, as you heard earlier, prayer storm is not a church. We are there to facilitate and be a catalyst for prayer in the church. So we serve in our local church as well. And, you know, our pastor was saying to me, oh, James, I was in a prayer meeting and one of the people came to me and said, I want to do covenant and pray now. Can we start? All right and <laughs> and I was like I was like my pastor's name is Pastor Joe I was like Joe I, I think we need to bring some teaching around this because I don't think people understand what this is and so that's what I hope um, to do right now so I want to just state a few things about uh, what covenant praying is not okay so many churches have prayer meetings uh, some don't have prayer meetings which is really sad and Matt made reference today the Lord is wanting to raise up a prayer culture not a prayer meeting Uh, Because when you start to pray regularly, what really happens is you raise up an altar 
And I'm not, I don't have time to go deep into that. There are other teachings we've put out that has covered the whole concept of altars. You raise up an altar, but you got to realize that altars are not just divine, as in from the Holy Spirit inspired. Altars, altars can also be demonic in nature. And when they're demonic in nature, they're serviced by people in the dark realm, and uh, they release all kinds of filth and darkness in the region that impacts the people in that region. So... God is not just wanting to have a prayer meeting. He's wanting us to raise up a prayer culture because that the altar we raise is going to be very strong and potent. However, it's not just about the praying because people think we're just going to get together and pray. What makes prayer powerful is not the activity of the prayer. It's the priest offering the sacrifice. You are a priest. And you're called to be a royal priesthood. So part of the job of a priest is to service an altar. And when you have a priest, you have an altar. If you have an altar, you have sacrifices that are put on that altar. And those sacrifices arise to heaven and they have to be acceptable. Do you realize heaven has a protocol for what it accepts? The fact that you sang holy does not mean heaven accepted your worship. The fact that you say, Jesus, I love you, does not mean heaven accepted that. Because when you worship and when you pray, it arises as incense. But there are some sort of incense that arise from churches that are stinking in God's nostrils. (laughs) Because the priests offering the incense are not in alignment with God's emphasis. So what they're doing is they're involved in religious activity, thinking there's power being released. But in fact, the devil is not scared because they, you see, Uh, you can't use the devil's tools and not pay tax. We are using things from the kingdom of darkness, i.e. jealousy, i.e. unforgiveness, i.e. competition, selfish ambition, lust. We have all sorts of things that we have often in the body of Christ come into agreement with while we're worshipping. There's all sorts of jealousies and competitions going on, sometimes even on the platform. And we sound good. See, the song can sound good to you, but it doesn't mean it's accepted in heaven. A good voice does not mean worship is taking place. And so God, before He accepts the sacrifice or the worship, He's first wanting to accept the priest, the person offering it. And as I've said before and I'll say again, you cannot rob a bank and pay tithe. And think that because you're paying tithe, 10% of what you rob from the bank, (laughs) that somehow God is going to be okay with you and just ignore the fact that you just did something horrible. Are you with me? So God is not just concerned about what you're doing. He's concerned about how you got to where you are to do what you're doing and the, 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 the alignment you have with Him. So I want to say to you, covenant praying is not meeting weekly to pray. So some people are like, okay, we're just going to meet weekly to pray. You know, and lots of churches already do that. Lots of people already, we're just going to meet weekly. We're going to have a regular prayer meeting and we're going to do this and we're going to just change it from a prayer meeting and call it covenant praying. That is not covenant praying. I can meet with, I can say to someone, okay, let's pray right now. Let's pray into this. The fact that we agree to pray together at a set time does not mean we've stepped into covenant praying. Another thing that is not covenant praying is you cannot just pick anyone at random. You, let's covenant pray together. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So I'm going to explain what it is. So to understand covenant praying, you have to understand what covenant is. A covenant is a relationship between two partners who make binding promises to each other and work together towards a common goal. Covenants often involve blood, scripturally. Covenants involve oaths and sacrifices. Covenants define obligations and commitments, but they're different to contracts. Contracts don't have a personal, relational touch to them. A marriage relationship is not a contract, (laughs) right? Well, I hope yours isn't a contract. (laughs) It's a what? It's a covenant. On the day when you make those vows, those are binding vows. You're entering into a covenant relationship. There's something deeper than just a mental agreement. And so when we look at the story of these 20 women and what the Lord did through, it's amazing to me 
that uh, this happened so many years ago. And the Lord is using the story of these 20 women to bring a revival everywhere right now for prayer. You know, they may not have hit their 90 days, but God is using their story to awaken a whole new level of intensity across the earth right now. That is inspiring to me. And so, one, they were in a relationship with each other. And so one of the things I want to emphasize is when you talk about effective praying, you cannot ignore the importance of deep relationships and godly relationships. In fact, many people don't realize this, but there are teachings in the Bible on prayer that don't talk about prayer minus Relationships. In fact, when they talk about prayer, you see relationship in the context. Example, Matthew 18. Do you know what Matthew 18 says? Matthew 18 says, whatever you bind on earth will be what's already bound in heaven. How many of you know that scripture? But when you read the verses prior to that, you know what it says? If your brother has something against you, can you hear me somebody? <laughs> if your brother has something against you, go to him or go to her. But I mean, most of the church don't do that. If you offend me, you know what tends to happen? You go to the next person, tell them what they've done. The next person, tell them what they've done. Instead of, the, the Bible says, go to the person. Someone say the person. person. So, Jesus gives the framework for dealing with issues because he's aware that we're not always going to get on with each other. And because we're humans, we're going to rub each other the wrong way. It's just life. You know, I, you know my wife likes to squeeze the toothpaste in a messy way. And I like it in order from the bottom up. Her preference is different to mine. It's just life. So because, so I don't know what that woohoo is for though. <laughs> so the fact that we have different nature means there's going to be moments where there'll be a clash with my preference and your preference. It's not unspiritual to have a clash. It just becomes a dangerous point if we don't know how to handle it properly, then demons get involved. That's why it gives the prescription for sorting things out. Go to them. Don't go to everyone else. Go to them. Sort it out. If they don't listen, tell it to the church. If they don't listen, if then he said, tell it to the elders and tell the church. Then you know what it says? If they don't listen and you don't sort it out, let them be to you like a heathen. I don't know if people actually enact that scripture. You know what it means? It means if that person is not willing to come into union and come into a place of uh, 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 connectedness, back in relationship, let them be expelled from your community. They cannot be in the community anymore. Are you hearing me? So the person cannot be in the community because they're not willing to, to forgive or let go and they're still holding on to offense. And if you allow them to stay in the community and they're still holding to that offense, they will become a poison to the unity and the communion in the room. I don't know if I can go. I have a friend. I'm not going to say her name. She's a well-respected minister. And um, she had a stroke. Half of her body paralyzed. She was healthy, but just had this stroke. And this was going on for a while. She's a prayer warrior too. And so she didn't know what was going on. She went into a meeting. I think it was a South American minister who was walking in the gifts of the Son, Men of Spirit and had a deliverance ministry. He just came behind her. He put his hand on her shoulder. He said something like this, I paraphrase. I pull out of you the, the arrow of judgment or what's it, or jealousy. Or, he just pulled, and when he just said those words, I, I was pulling something out of her that had been launched against her. She fell out in the spirit and was gone. And when she came round to herself and she woke up, she was completely healed. Now listen, so she asked the guy, the minister, what was that about? You know what he said? And you know this is in your Bible. She said, he said to her, there's someone and there's, I don't know if there's someone or some people in your community who have an ill emotion and thoughts and desires towards you. And because you've all been taking communion together, the act of taking communion together sealed them in your union which gave the enemy access and a right to strike you through them. Are you hearing me today? So when we take communion, have you noticed why it tells us to take communion with a seriousness and to examine ourselves and how many people have died 
Paul says that. Many of you are asleep because we've not handled the communion table with the seriousness that we should. Because when you de- when you take that communion, you're declaring a common unity with each other and with Christ. So if you, if you admit into that unity declaration, someone that's holding a grudge or holding a fence and they're part of your community and you take that community, you're making a declaration in the spirit. And that becomes a legal access for the enemy to come in to do all sorts of things. Are you hearing me today? So when we talk about prayer and you look through the scripture, you see why God is very strict about getting rid of people who just want to, uh, they, they, they just have this spirit of strife. There's some people that just always want to fight and they never want to forgive. Do you hear me? Those are not the people we need to be around because if you truly encounter Christ, you should really have a heart that's wanting to always end up in reconciliation. We may have disagreements, but we need to get to the point of reconciliation. And it's sad that oftentimes the people, you see, when you've got bad breath, you're the last one to know you've got it. (laughs) Sometimes the people who are the strife causes, there's so many wounds and issues unresolved in their lives. And they're not even aware of the depth of those things and they get offended at everything else and then put, project it to people. But don't look at, you left that church because the pastor said something that offended you. And the church before that, you didn't stay there for more than two years. And the church before that, after three years, but when you got there, it was the best church in the whole world. And then two months later, you got offended, you're out. Next church, three months later, you're out. Next church, two years later, and you haven't stopped to look at the common denominator. In all those places you left, you are the one that has been, are you with me? But no, you've not stopped examining. Why am I easily offended? You have father issues. You have issues from your childhood, wounds that you never dealt with. But you're not honest enough with yourself to have healing. You're blinded to your own issues. So that's the bad breath. Everyone else is feeling the impact apart from you. Everywhere you go, people are like, whoa. Because <laughs> it's so, so, there has to be a self-awareness where you start to be aware of the things going on in your heart. And then God begins to deal with that. And then it's easy for you to come into relationship while you're aware of the wounds and the areas where God is working on you. And when things stir up with a heart of reconciliation, you always want to bring order and reconciliation. You see, I'll just say this and now move on. If you're in a situation where it seems like a simple thing to resolve, but as you start talking about it, it gets complicated. It gets complicated. And by the time you're maybe two hours and you're like, oh no, where on earth are we right now? I've never been in those sort of situations. You're like, I don't even know where we are. I want to tell you, a spirit is involved. <laughs> when things are like, I, I thought this was very straightforward, but now it's going to this, going to this. Now I'm, I'm, I'm completely overwhelmed and confused as to what we're actually trying to sort out here right now. And it's like every attempt to bring reconciliation is just leading up to flare-ups and more and more. It's like there's a spirit involved and someone is partnering with a demon and they don't want to let go of that thing. So someone needs to be honest with themselves and say, Lord, I'm wounded and I need healing in my soul. So we can't talk about effective covenant praying if we don't talk about relationship. I just mentioned to you Matthew 18. Do you know another scripture that talks about effective praying? James 5. James 5, 16. Many of you will know the scripture. You know what it says in James 5? It says, confess your trespasses one to another that you may be healed. And you all know this part. The effective fervent prayer of the righteous man makes tremendous power available, effective in his working. The King James says it this way. The effective fervent prayer of the righteous man avails much. How many of you have heard that verse before? We always quote the B that says, the effective fervent prayer avails much. But we forget the B before it. It's all in the same verse. He says, confess your sins one to another. He didn't say confess your sins to God. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. Obviously, we confess our sins to the Lord. He's faithful and just forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But the verse is emphasizing relationship and accountability as a foundation for effective praying. We want to go effective praying, but we don't want accountability. We don't want a relationship. We want to mind our own business. We don't want to come under any authority. And yet we think our prayer is going to be powerful. We are deceiving ourselves, church. 
There are lots of prayer meetings and they're releasing all this intense prayer, but they have no authority, authority in the realm of the Spirit because they have not maximized their corporate ranking in the Spirit because they have no solid relationships and covenant relationships with one another. Deep-seated competition and envy going on in their hearts while they're contending for revival. Oh, Lord, move in the city. But there's someone over there who's praying, but he's, he's eyeing up the pastor's position. He believes he's more anointed than the pastor. And she'll be the one preaching. Oh, Lord, move in the city. Someone over there right there is feeling jealous of the woman over there because they've just got a breakthrough with marriage and they've been believing God for a marriage and they've not had it. And are you with me? Person over there jealous about that person. This one fighting with this one. And this is all going on in our hearts. Yeah, we are intensely, oh Lord, we cry for a move. Do you realize that in the spirit realm, they're not impressed by the fervency of our prayers? It's not about how fervent you are. It's about where are you praying from? Where is your location in the spirit? Because when you're in the flesh, in i.e., when there's offense in your heart, when you're not learning to walk in accountability and relationship and confessing sin to one another, your ranking goes down in the spirit, as in you're low, you're at the bottom. So it doesn't matter how fervent you're praying, you're going nowhere because you're not following God's principles. It's not just about the act of praying. Where are you in the spirit when you do that prayer? How submitted are you to God's authority? How submitted are you to the leadership is placed over you? You see, because we're a prayer storm and we do prayer meetings, I'm sorry to say this, but we attract weird people. I'm sorry, but it's the reality. We, sometimes we attract people that don't want to go to a local church and submit to leaders. Oh, I'm anointed, I'm called to. They have all these dreams of, you know, I, they want to be on platforms and preaching, but they don't want to follow the process. Glory follows order. The, God's glory didn't just drop in the temple, bam. He dropped in the temple because the temple was aligned. There was measurement. Everything was done according to the way God wanted it. God is very specific, very specific. You want glory? You're going to learn how to be narrow-minded in alignment with how God is. You know, God is narrow. If those of you that don't know him may think he can, anything goes. Because you're still way, 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 way in the outer court, disconnected from relationship. But the closer you get, you realize God has a strict opinion. You could be in the middle of a conversation and he tells you he's grieved by that conversation. The person you're talking to doesn't even feel anything. They're a Christian too. But if you're walking with God, he starts to put his hand on every area of your life. Some of people are just having Jesus in their backpack like he's just a part of their lives. It's like they're, having, they're not having their lives revolve around Jesus. They're having Jesus revolve around their lives. So when they're comfortable, they take him on. Oh, it's church Sunday. We go to church now. Oh, it's prayer meeting. Oh, I'm tired. I can't be bothered. Disney Plus is on. Oh, you know, you like to pray. And then when crisis comes, you know what they do? They find all the prayer warriors and they start texting them. Pray for me, pray for me, pray for me, pray for me. But they don't want to pray themselves. So you have people that are just having Jesus as one of these, it's not just a part of their life. He is not the centerpiece of their civilization. He is not the reason for their living. When you begin to truly walk with Jesus, he begins to colonize you and cause you to make decisions that you will not make in your natural self because he's king, he's Lord. A lot of his preferences will clash with yours. And when they clash, does he have his way or do you have your way? Oh, by the way, have they ever clashed or do you tend to have more of your way in your relationship with God? Because many Christians, you know, oh, Lord, you love me. I thank you for your love. Oh, oh you're my father. They, they know how to love on God and sing these love songs. But when he comes in with the hand of discipline, they're out. Oh, grace, grace, the crowd, grace. Don't even get me started on that. <laughs> the grace of God is not the license for carnality. Any teaching on grace that gives you liberty for carnality is heresy. Yeah. And so there's a lot going on right now in the body of Christ where there's all these teachings on grace. But when you examine it, it's giving liberty to lots of carnality. People just live in the flesh, calling it grace. When you live under his grace, that he starts to, like a sat nav, he starts to determine where you go and how you go and what you do and how you do it. So... He's concerned about relationships and order. And I don't have time to break down James 5 properly because that's not really the essence of my teaching. I just want to show you in Scripture 
that before prayer, there is order of relationship that God values greatly. In fact, he then says to the husbands, and I believe to the wives too, if you're not in right relationship with your spouse, what did he say? It hinders your prayers. But we want to do the prayer. But See, if you just had a fight with your spouse, you probably need to add another hour to your prayer time to recover from what that fight has done to the density of the presence you were carrying before the fight. <laughs> because you can't even pray until you bring order. I'm ba- I, honestly, I am baffled by Christians that are praying, but I know they're not in good relationship with people. Like, are, are you, are you, you're deceived. That, it, 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 that's it, you are deceived. To think you can come here shouting and praying, yeah, you're holding a fence. And you think it makes no difference? You can deceive me, but you cannot deceive the spirit world. The demons that cause that offense are not impressed by your prayer. In fact, they're like cheering you on as you pray. Like, oh, go on, pray. They, they, they're, not, they're not intimidated by prayer. Some of you pray and demons are comfortable in your presence. Because as you're, as you're executing the prayer, you have items that belong to them in your closet. And as I said, you can't use the devil's tools and not pay tax. So he comes to collect his tax. While you're praying, it's like, oh, go on, praying. Oh, yeah, release. You're calling fire. They're going to be calling fire with you too because they're not scared of you. Relationships are critical. I am not just preaching to you something that sounds right. I live it. Relationships are key in my life. And if I have people on you know, my team, they'll tell you, I have zero tolerance for strife. If you have an issue with me, come to me. Let's talk. I don't care that I'm the boss. Let's talk, let's talk it through. And let's get to a place of peace. Because we cannot afford to give the enemy any room. Zero room. And then once we deal with it, we move on. But if you don't want to deal with it, you want to keep holding it up, bringing it up. And are we really wanting to get to reconciliation? Or are you wanting to just hold on to your hurt? Because if we're going to walk together, we're going to hurt each other. It's just like, because I'm going to do things not knowingly, it might hurt you. You might do things not knowingly, it's going to hurt me. But then let's talk about it and bring order. Because if we don't, forget about prayer. Forget about worship. You can do all the shouting you want, but the realm of the Spirit is not scared. The realm of the Spirit is not moved. And all you're doing is wasting your energy. So, these 20 women came into this covenant relationship. I want to point you to something really significant. Have you heard of the phrase African time? <laughs> now, I don't work with African time. Those of you that came to the event, you know we started on time. I don't do African time. Even though I have African heritage, I, am, I don't do that. But I've been to meetings. If I'm thinking of one right now, and the person is in this room. <laughs> It was a birthday party. It was advertised for, let's say, 3 p.m. I said to my wife, I, I think I might get there at 3 p.m. She's like, James, this is an African meeting. Forget about getting there at 3 p.m. So I get there an hour later. <laughs> I was like, okay. I got there an hour later, and the meeting had not started yet. <laughs> <laughs> I think the meeting probably started 30 minutes later after that. So the reason why I'm saying that is you cannot enter into a covenant, especially as it relates to this type of covenant prayer, without dealing with the idols of the land. So, in Uganda, and even with the Ugandans I've worked with, keeping to time is a struggle. Are you hearing me? Keeping to time is a struggle. So, as part of their covenant, they didn't just say, we're going to meet to pray. They added an element in the covenant that was disconnecting them from the idolatry in the territory they were in. So they said, we're going to keep to time. Even though in that culture, people struggle to keep to time. They said, we're going to start at 3 p.m. and go all the way to 9 p.m. And this is why it gets interesting because they said, if any of us comes late, and we are on day 89, we're going to reset and start from day one. That was part of their covenant agreement. Are you hearing me? So in the West, in this culture, the average person tends to keep to time, in my experience. 
So if we're going to go into covenant prayer, we're still going to have time as part of it. But we need to add elements to the covenant that disconnect us from the idols in the territory we're in. Are you hearing me today? <laughs> because that has a dimension of authority to our starting point in prayer. We're disconnected by agreement from the things that rule in the air. Part of what we deal with here is distraction. So if you want to go into covenant and pray, you might need to consider some dimensions of what sort of distractions you're all going to come. What sort of distractions you're going to come into agreement to get rid of? Are you, are you tracking with me? So it's like you have to take time to reflect. It's not just something you enter in without a lot of thought. Let me shock you with something. Do you know James Kawaya? I asked him this question. Have you been able to do covenant prayer all these years? You know what he said to me? No. As powerful as the covenant prayer thing is, even James has not been able. And I said, James, you know what? My dream is that I will do this and I'll do it well soon. You know why he's not being, he's tried, but when they start, as they get on, because people have wounds in their hearts they've not dealt with. Because, you see what I was talking about, relation? Because people are not dealing with issues, and yet they want to pray, as they start out, maybe they get to day 10 or day 12, everything breaks apart. Because somebody is holding on to wounds, and demons get involved, and they become the weak spot that the enemy uses to break it apart. You cannot go into covenant prayer with people if your heart is not knitted with them. There is something the scripture calls one accord. Can I remind you, the day of Pentecost came as a result of covenant praying. It wasn't labeled covenant praying, but that is what happened. Because Jesus said, do not depart. Do not, do not depart. These were the terms of the covenant. So they were called to stay. And see, their prayer meeting had a start time. But it didn't have an end time. That was part of the covenant. They were going to stay until. So they would have stayed for 90 days if that's how long it took. Jesus didn't tell them it was going to take 10 days or 8 days. He just said until. So part of the binding agreement was we're going to do this until. And know that. See, this is why your church prayer meeting is not covenant prayer. Because in this prayer meeting that led to the day of Pentecost, they knew the number of people in it. And no one could join them. So there's not some, oh yeah, you know, oh, you want to pray? You want to pray? Oh, let's get together. We two days, oh, you can join us too. No, 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 no. <laughs> you enter into a binding agreement and you're there together. No one can join you. No one joined the 120. They started and they finished 120. The number is there for a reason. Because no one could join them. Do you think Jesus didn't heal other people? He didn't raise other people from the dead? Where are all the crowds? Of all the crowds, they all came down to 120. Because those were the ones that were willing to walk together in covenant relationship. And because they could walk together in covenant relationship, when they started to pray, they were bound together by the Spirit. So they became in one accord. Listen to this. In the book of Acts 1.14, they continued in one accord. Acts 2.1, they were in one accord, when the day of Pentecost came. Acts 2.24, they, they, they continued daily in one accord. Acts 4.24, they raised their voice to the Lord in one accord. You read through the early parts of Acts. You see that word over and over again. One accord, because they were in a level of covenant relationship. So they could walk with each other and it's like their prayers were fused together. There was a sense of heart connection. See, this is one of the problems we have. The times I'm in prayer meetings and even though you're praying, I'm not sure I know your heart. I can hear you praying, but I don't feel like we have connected. It's because we haven't. When we start to covenant and pray together, it's my heart trusts your heart. And there is no barrier between us. There is no emotional weirdness. There is a kind of, so when you start to pray, even though I don't know what you're praying, um, we are ready to get. Do you realize it's a difficult place to get in a meeting of 100 people? Even in a meeting of 20 people. 
So if we're going to get to that place of God, we have to journey to the place where I trust your heart. You trust my heart. And then we can walk together by the Spirit and the Holy Spirit can bind us together more. And I also find it's interesting that the more you pray with people, the more you start to know them. And some of you go to prayer meetings, as the prayer is going on, you're judging everyone in your mind. You're like, just shut up, please. And then there's some of the people that grab the mic and start to preach pray. Are you talking to God or are you talking to us? Because it sounds like you're preaching to us. And some people come and grab the mic and they're praying correctional prayers. Does anyone know what I'm talking about here? <laughs> that is the culture in many places. You see, so we, can't st- we cannot step into covenant and praying because we don't trust each other at a heart level. So when someone says, oh Lord, we agree for blah, 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 and everybody says amen, that amen is often just an intellectual verbal agreement. It's not at a heart level. Amen is not just your words. It's that we are coming into alignment and agreement at a heart level. So you know, I remember once there was a guy on our team, you know, and this thing I'm teaching you, the times I sit with my team and I teach them, we need to work together in unity. If the issues, let's sort it out. And so we have, by God's grace, you know, a level of agreement and unity and zero tolerance for strife. And I remember saying, look, we always have to agree. If something's going on, talk about it. Bring it into the open. Don't hide it. And so we had, we had someone on our team that was always, there was a time where it was like just difficult. And people would say, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? Be like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Everyone comes to me later, James, I'm not sure they're okay. And I ask them, are you sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. So months went like this. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. One day I chose to press. Are you sure, really, really this is months later. Are you sure you're okay? They're like, well, you know, I'm offended about this and I'm upset about this and I'm upset about that. So I said, now I'm mad at you. I said, I'm not mad at you because you're upset about anything I did. I'm mad at you because you were in our community saying Amen. So all those prayers we were praying three months ago, but your amen was fake. Because your heart was not okay with me. I don't want your amen. <laughs> Take your amen away because we're not together. Let's sort out the issue. If you think I've offended you, let's talk it through. Let's get to reconciliation. Then we can have a real amen. Because you're, you're saying amen with your words, but your heart is fighting me. Didn't David say, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable? So your mouth can be saying one thing and your heart is saying another thing. And heaven doesn't accept that. There has to be a unity of sound. So it have to be in one accord. Um, you can't have a covenant without sacrifice. In Psalms 50 verse 5, Listen to what the Lord says. Gather my saints together to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Are you hearing me? Gather my saints to me. Those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Sacrifice is a language of the spirit realm. Sacrifice releases power. And people in the dark realm understand this. I don't have time to show you scripture after scripture where people have exploited the power of sacrifice in the dark realm and they've released a power, they've released power that's worked against the people of God. So the Lord is wanting to gather some people together. And these people he wants to gather together, he wants to use them to affect real change in their region. See, when God wants to do some significant things in regions, he looks for certain types of saints. Are you hearing me? God wants to move in the United Kingdom. God wants to move in Manchester. He is not just going to look for anyone that says, oh, Jesus, I love you. He's looking for some saints that have come into personal covenant with God by sacrifice. So forget about getting into covenant praying with anyone else. Do you have covenant praying on your own with God? You cannot keep to a prayer time. You cannot pray consistently for one hour or two hours, for two weeks or three weeks or four weeks, and yet you want to go into covenant praying for 90 days? You're joking. 
Because, because you don't have a personal altar that's strong, you're a weak link in that covenant relation. Didn't you hear the story? How they attacked the pastor? They started with his covenant relationship because he, they attacked his daughter. Because she was crying at night, he couldn't pray. Because he couldn't attend his personal altar, when he showed up at the covenant praying altar, his discernment level was low. Because if the summer level was low, they could send in an agent to the meeting. And they sent an agent to the meeting, the agent could join them. All because his altar, his fire was dimming. Because he couldn't sleep, and because he couldn't sleep, he couldn't pray. Are you? So you don't have a personal altar. Yeah, you want to get into a corporate one. You don't know how to pray for an hour. You can't pray for two hours. In fact, we talk about praying for five hours, and you think we're from another planet. You have no stamina within you. And by the way, if you're going to do covenant praying, it doesn't happen in 30 minutes. The Acts 2 covenant praying went on all day. How long can you stay without God showing up? How long can you stay and you feel no goosebump, no gizbump, no nice feeling, no fuzzy thing on the inside? Can you still stay? Many Christians give up so easy. Oh, I don't feel anything. Oh, God, I don't think you're here. Oftentimes when you start en enacting that covenant sacrificial praying on a personal level, God's, God sometimes sits back to watch how serious you are. And you may feel dry. It may feel like God is a thousand miles away. It may feel like nothing is happening. But God is just watching to see how serious are you. So if you cannot attend to your own personal altar and there is no sacrifice on it, what makes you think you can connect to a corporate one? You're going to become a liability, not an asset. And many Christians are liabilities. And I, some of the Christians walk into a prayer meeting and they drain out the life in the prayer meeting. Others walk in and they bring fire into the room. Which one do you want to be? Do you want to be one of these people that just drains life? You just bring a deadness everywhere you go because you're not carrying life? See, you can come to meetings like this and ride on the passion of the atmosphere here while you have none. I am not after something that looks good right here. I want to see what's happening when you're in your room by yourself and there's no band and it's you and your Bible. In fact, let's lock you up in a prison cell with just your Bible and see what level of spirituality you have after two months. Do you know how to find God on your own without external props of music? Apostle Paul did not have an iPod or an iPhone in his prison cell to listen to Elevation music, to listen to Bethel music, to listen to the Lester, latest Christian artists. He had none of that stuff. Yet he had a deeper walk with God than most of us, if not all of us in this room. So in his walk with God, he did not have external props. With your walk with God, you have lots of external props and yet you think you're deep. Let's take away the external props and see what you really have. Do you know how to find God when there is no one cheering you on? You feel bored. You feel God is a thousand. Can you stay there? Many Christians cannot stay. You watch the video of James Coyle. Oh, I want to do covenant prayer. I want to do Can you stay in the presence of God for six hours? Can you stay there for 12 hours when he says nothing? You think you can manipulate God by your tears? You cannot make God do what you want to do, how you want him to do it. He is God and he comes when he wants to come. So there are times when the process of waiting kills you. But if you don't know how to seek God by yourself, please forget about covenant praying on a corporate level. We want covenant praying because we know it's going to be one of the keys for revival. But before we get there, God is wanting to do some personal work, surgery in our hearts. Look at this. First Kings, uh, sorry, Second Kings. 2 Kings 25, verse 1 to 7. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. Everyone say against it. Say encamped against it. Say that. I'm saying that because I want you to note that. He came and encamped against it. They built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Verse 4. Then the city wall was broken through. Everyone say broken through. And all the men of war fled at night by 
the way of the gate between two walls, which was by the king's garden, even though the Chaldeans were still encamped around against the city. And the king went by the way of the plain. You know, I'll just stop there because I've already read the bit that I want to emphasize. So this is the enemy, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. He encamped against or encamped around the people of God. He encamped around Jerusalem. He built a siege wall. Do you know what siege is? The whole army encamp around the whole city. And it means no one can go in to the city and no one can go out. In other words, they took charge of the city gateways. And they were waging war against the city but it was a type of war where because they besieged the city, the people in the city, because nothing can go in or come out, they basically starve to death. And so when the siege started was not when the breakthrough came. Are, are you with me? They had to keep that siege. I've not calculated how many days, but it was many months, maybe years. They had to keep that siege around the city for many months. And then after a while, because nothing was going in and coming out, the people in the land were growing weaker and growing weaker and growing weaker. And then eventually they could break through. Can I announce to you, that is revival in the negative. Did you hear me? What they did there is what happens when you step into covenant praying. Your bond of unity and depth of relationship with one another and the consistency of your prayers, especially because you're involving repentance in it, you are building a siege wall, so to speak, in the spirit. Because you see, the powers of darkness that function in our territory, what empowers them is sin. So a powerful evangelist comes, preaches the gospel, people get saved and they don't just say yes to God, they become disciples. And we have multiple thousands of that really happening. That weakens the influence of the principality or the powers of wickedness in the atmosphere over that territory because they're losing grip on more people they can influence and control. Are you hearing me? So when the people decide they want to start to pray and not just repent for their sins, but repent for the sins of the territory they're in, are you hearing me? they start to build a siege wall in the spirit because now they're interfering with that which is empowering the powers of darkness. See, you don't have to come against the devil to be effective in prayer. Repentance, especially when you're going to deep repentance, you repent over the sins, even of the land, of the territory. By you going into that by the spirit, you're weakening the influence of the enemy because the enemy hates repentance. Now, do you see why the enemy releases the perversion of the grace message? That makes people think, oh, I've repented once and for all. I don't ever need to repent of my sins again because my sins are forgiven forever. When Jesus in the book of Revelation tells the church to repent, what Bible are you reading for crying out loud? Jesus said to the church, repent. And yet you're coming here preaching because you're eloquent. You've got a theology degree. Some people go to seminaries and end up in cemeteries. Spiritually, they die there. I'm not saying every seminary is that. But some people, their knowledge, they, their heads grow big and their hearts grow small. And because of the rate at which their head is growing and their heart is not growing in a commensurate rate, they die because all the knowledge is killing them. And then they come up with demonic ideologies that we don't need to repent anymore. That's one of the ways the enemy weakens our effectiveness. Repentance is a key part of warfare. You have to get good at repenting. And the Lord will convict you if you're walking with Him. Then you get better at repenting. And the times where you go into intercession, He leads you to repent for other people's sins. Of what's going on in your territory. This is biblical. Read Daniel. Daniel was fasting and repenting, not just for his sins, but the sins of his people. While he was praying, angelic intervention taking place. So, you know, I said to you earlier at the start of this preach that this whole covenant, this whole video that went viral thing, I know it went viral at the right time because with my team, I went away to have some, a prayer retreat back in June or something. Went somewhere away for three days, came back. I said to my team, we're going to go on a nine days prayer. So I know this last minute, you've all booked your holidays and all that. But those of you that can do this, I want you to commit with me in August 
we did three lots, three days over three weeks. So week one, three days. Week two, three days. Week three, three days. And this is my attempt to, to just have a go at covenant praying. I don't want us to, I, we're not announcing this, it's just going to be a handful of us. I think there was maybe five one week, maybe seven another week, maybe 11 another week. I said, all we're going to do is from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., we're going to see God. All day locked away in a room. And so we were pressing and we're praying. This is the first time we've done anything like that as a team, just our staff team and some of our friends. We didn't invite anyone else apart from people we chose to invite. And even there, as I reflect, I realize the things that we can grow in, even in the kind of sacrifices we're putting on the altar. Because remember I said to you, you have to involve in the covenant something that's disconnecting you from the idolatry of the territory you're in. Not just the time. The time thing was a struggle for those guys in Uganda, but it's not so much a struggle for us. But even the length of time was increased. And in those times, you see, what's happening right now with this video, God was already stirring in our hearts. Wasn't it, Matt? Matt was there when we are praying. The Lord was speaking and praying through us about this. So when this starts to happen, even though we did not connect the dots, we knew that this was a move of God. Because it wasn't like we inspired it or we, we made it happen. We just posted something and boom, it's like wildfire going everywhere. We know because God is saying we're stepping into a shift in a season. We're stepping into a new season. And so I've said to my team, we had a go at it, <laughs> but we're going to have another go at it. And see, this is the thing. The covenant praying, I don't believe three days is enough. See, the, the women, those 20 women, they stepped into what I call the Elijah mode. The Elijah mode of prayer. The Elijah mode of prayer is long and it's fervent. That's James 5. The fervent, earnest, the earnest, fervent prayer. You see, the effectual, fervent prayer, that talks about length and that talks about depth of intensity and consecration. So I think three days is a good start. Now, I don't think you can put a number on it, but I think... If the day of Pentecost came after we are thinking about 10 days, I think 10 days is a, is, is a, is a fairly decent starting point for a good stab at good covenant praying. But I'd love to have a go of 40 days. <laughs> Do you see that in the West? We don't have time for this. Can you lock up with 40? Wait, can you lock up and see God for 40 days with a small group of people? Three hours, six hours a day. Do you, see, we're doing all these meetings, but when you really look at it, I'm guarantee, I guarantee you, I don't think there's anyone in the UK doing that level of depth where they're locked themselves away for six hours, going for 40 days, 80 days. Maybe there is, but I, that, that is not the norm and that is not common because it's a huge deal of sacrifice. I am sharing this to help you realize those of you like, oh, I want to jump in the covenant praying, is not as simple as you think it is. There is a lot, you have to count the cost. And there is a lot to, to consider before you step in. But before you, go to, before you get too discouraged, <laughs> you can start with you and God now. You can come into covenant with God. Say, Lord, I would love to give you two hours every day. Would you give me the grace to do that? Look at your diary. Okay, I can give one hour in the morning and one hour at night. Okay. And then give yourself. Week one, week two, and keep going. And maybe you find that you easily lose your commitments because of things. Maybe you might want to make yourself accountable to someone. Hey, hey, I'm feeling the Lord calling me. I want to give myself in this way. Can you just check up on me and, you know, I just want to have some sort of accountability. I want to build consistency in my devotion. As you start to see God, there are sacrifices He's going to require of you. They didn't say in, uh, what's it called, uh, Romans 12, offer your bodies, your life, you offer yourself as a living sacrifice. And then it goes on to say, holy and acceptable. So some sacrifices can be unacceptable. 
holy and acceptable. So when you start to seek God, he starts to, he starts to influence the way you seek him. You could start seeking him saying, okay, Lord, I want to I wanna give you two hours. And then he could call you to spend a whole day with him and call you to lock yourself in a room for a whole day on a Saturday because you're free that day. Would you be willing to do that? Or you go, oh God, you know, I'm busy. I've got this appointment. I've got this, I've got that. Well, the moment you start to respond that way, you're not really ready for a true covenant relationship because there are demands that that relationship puts on you. It's a two-way thing. You're coming before God because you want to go deeper with Him. And then because He's wanting to bring you deeper, He doesn't just want to admit let me say it this way. Have you ever tried to share something that really means a lot to you, to someone, but you can feel that they might not appreciate the depth of it? Even though they might be saying they want to hear it, but you just don't want to share it because you don't want to waste. It's like it's so precious, you just don't want to say to anyone. God is like that and more. There are things that he wants to share on his heart. He's not just going to share it because he say, okay, Lord, I, I want to know you. So he waits to see how serious you are. That's why Hebrews 11 says, is it Hebrews 11? Somewhere around there. God is a rewarder of those. Note he didn't say of those who seek him. That diligence speaks of longevity, intensity, and tenacity. And not moving. And I felt, and I want to wrap up now because I want us to pray. I felt the need to um, just bring some clarity on what covenant praying is and what it isn't. Because as God has used this video to stir many people, there is an increase in desire for this type of prayer. Because God is wanting the church to step into this type of prayer. But I want to say to you, there is a process there's a journey he's taking us on. So as we come to a point of response right now, what I want you to realize is the Lord is wanting you to make a covenant with him by sacrifice. And then maybe in days ahead, the Lord might lead you to start to pray with certain people. And you, and you want to have a go at this? Consider what I'm saying right now. I want to approach some friends and say, I would love to pray with you for the next 10 days, for six hours a day. And by the way, I don't think covenant praying has to be for six hours. I think it's going to be long hours. It might be three hours. I don't think I can put a time on it. But it's definitely not 30 minutes. There is, a, there is a longevity. That's the Elijah mode. Oh, something else. This is just a random thing. This pastor who had the revelation, it's interesting because... He, he didn't just have a revelation of the covenant praying. He had a revelation of the time of the praying. He had a revelation of the evening sacrifice. And you see this when Elijah set up that altar that was broken and called down fire from heaven. He set up the altar about the time of the evening sacrifice, which is 3 p.m. So it's important we don't just pray but we also understand the strategy behind the timings of our prayers. That there is thought and revelation behind what we're doing. We're not just doing it because, okay, you know what, let's just pick a random time. Okay, let's do this. But if we're going to step into that sort of corporate praying, there's some thought put around the timing of it. And so the Lord is wanting to invite us, the church, to the place of first, stepping into covenant with Him. Some of your altars are broken. Some of your altars, the fire is going out. And some of your altars are non-existent. But tonight, that's going to change. <laughs> Those of you online, I want to invite you to this place of saying, Lord, I don't know if I'll get to the place where I can do this with a group of people. I would love to, Lord. But first off, I want my covenant with you. This relationship, this commitment to keep offering sacrifices at odd hours for long periods of time, whenever you call and whenever you wanted me to. This kind of consistency, I'm wanting to sign up to it. The thing about covenant is it's also built on the foundation of consistency. It's not something that happens weekly or every other month. It's a daily activity. 
You can't do covenant praying once a week. It doesn't work that way. It, it, it's a continual thing. You may do it for 21 days or 40 days or 90 days or however long, but it's, it's, it's consistent. The day of Pentecost came consistently. The siege wall around Jerusalem, it wasn't like they built it and then they went away. They stayed there until the breakthrough came. It's the same way with covenant praying on a personal level and also on a corporate level. Do you understand with me? I want us to take, I want us to take a few moments to respond to this. Those of you in the front, just take maybe a couple of steps back. And if these are your things, in fact, I might need some of the ushers to come and help us move some of these things out of the way. Just to create a space for you to respond. Many of you in this room, you're single, you're not married, you've got so much time on your hands and you're wasting it. Wasting it on Disney Plus. Wasting it on YouTube and Netflix. Watching movies. Some of you, part of your covenant is you need to get rid of entertainment. Some of you, you need to delete Instagram. Some of you need to get rid of social media altogether and get a dummy phone. Because you know that that is robbing you of depth in walk with God. As in, you have to get radical. It's a sacrifice. It's not just something that comes easy. When Jesus says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. Cutting off your right hand is not easy. It's never easy to cut off your own arm. I mean, it didn't mean doing literally, but it meant be that radical about getting rid of things that stop you from depth in, a re in relationship. Many Christians are in the shallow. Deep is calling unto deep, but they're in the shallow. If deep is calling unto deep, that means shallow is calling unto shallow. And many Christians are satisfied with a shallow place. But I want to launch into the deep. I want to give myself. I want prayer to shape my life. Not me just coming to pray when I'm in trouble or when I need breakthrough. No, I want to know the God of the universe for real, one on one. And what I'm calling you to today is to rebuild the broken altars and make those covenants again with the Lord and let the fire begin to burn on those altars and you become the sacrifice on that altar. And if that's you in this room tonight, that's you online, those of you in this room, I want you to come forward to this altar right now, this front bit. It's a sign of you saying, God, I want to rebuild these broken altars of prayer. Those of you online, you might want to just type in the comment section, maybe get on your knees before the Lord and say, Father, I want to rebuild the broken altars I want to come back into real covenant relationship with you, Lord. I truly want to seek you. Not just when I'm in trouble, when just when I want breakthrough and I want something to happen for me and I want a breakthrough here or there. I want the consistency of perpetual sacrifices being offered at your throne, being offered before you, Father. When you want to gather your saints in a region, I want to be one of those you can look at because I've come before you and I've made a covenant with you by sacrifice. Tonight I'm saying let the altars be rebuilt. Let the broken altars be rebuilt just like Elijah rebuilt the broken altars. I say, Father, rebuild the broken altars. Even right now, that's what we do. As we come before you in humility, we want to repent and turn away from our sin our inconsistencies, our distractions, where the God of this age has bound our minds and hearts by entertainment, by social media, by all sorts of filthiness. Oh Lord, we come before you right now. We say, God, let there be a realignment of every altar, a reordering of broken altars. In the name of Jesus. Oh Lord, we cry out to you because we know it is not our power, it is not our might, it is by your spirit. We come before you in our insufficiency and the weaknesses, the infirmities of our flesh. We say, God, would you swallow up our weaknesses and empower us?
to offer sacrifices that are acceptable at your altar. We rebuild the broken altars tonight. Yes, yes, yes. We lay down our lives before your throne. We say, God, let there be a realignment of broken altars. Asana Kabailo says Sivalos Tas Asatalayas Asatalayastes Asatalayastes Hebelete Bola Strabale de Bodas Esebala Strabale de Palada Bodas Abalayes Osis Abalayes Osis Ibela da Bunda Vesta Talasas Alignment with heaven Alignment with heaven Oh Lord where our souls are broken We ask for healing Healing in the inner man. Oh Father, we ask for order in our souls, oh God. Bring your order. Every fragmentation in our soul, begin to bring order to it. That the enemy will have no foothold, no inroad. Oh Father, we commit to the consistency. We commit to the place of prayer. We commit to the furnace. We commit to the prayer place. Oh Lord, shift us from stagnation. Shift us from confusion. Shift us from deceptions and bring us into consecrations. Bring us into places of the elevation of the Spirit. Holy Ghost, we say tonight, let there be a shift. Let there be a shift. Oh, the Spirit of grace and supplication. The Spirit of grace and supplication. The Spirit of tenacity. The Spirit of intensity. Rest upon us. Rest upon us. We will not come under that which rules in our culture. That which rules in this Western culture. Rules in the environment around us. We shift out of the realm of distraction. And we come into a place of focus. We will offer sacrifices that will be acceptable. We rebuild the altars. 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 We rebuild the altars.
Lasso Veneke Pai Lasso Rabakata Valere Vesto says Ay, 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 Open up the wells! 